tell him that you would sometimes Christians amaze me. You know, Christians that want to get you involved in politics or get you involved in saving the whales or saving the polar bears or the wolves or <laughs> saving something, I don't know. But it amazes me that I deal with regularly people asking me how come I don't get all worked up about politics, you know, like the president, you know, and getting somehow gung-ho bandwagon on, you know, let's go out and, you know, stir people up, get them excited to vote against something and not for something, or they have their own choices of what they want to be for, so they want to tell you what to be for. Well, I know what I'm for, and I'm doing it. <laughs> But that's not good enough, you see. People keep telling me they want me to get involved in what they're doing, you know, in this world, you know, to save the world. Or, like, we've got to save Israel as though Israel needs America or needs some kind of, like, group to get together to support them when they're feeling bad because, after all, people are, you know, not supporting Israel except America. Well... <laughs> You know, things get a little distorted sometimes, you know, and I, I kind of, you know, I do a news service and I, I do things and teach about allegories and I teach about fallacies and I teach about all these things that are being used to misrepresent what's really going on in the world and how people get carried away and don't really know what they're saying or what they're doing because, frankly, Israel is fine by itself. It can handle itself. It's doing just perfectly okay. And it's going to sell itself down the road, you know, to Satan, literally, in the form of the Antichrist. And I kind of wonder about people that tell me, well, we're going to support Israel right or wrong, no matter what. And I'm kind of, okay. That's kind of like in the old days when they used to, no matter what, we're supporting the government. You know, we believe in the government or the union. We believe in the union, no matter what. You know, Or we believe in our company, no matter what. Or we believe in the stock market, no matter what. And, you know... People are always looking for something to believe in, you know. They're always looking for something to put their passion in that they can see, touch, and feel so that they can get all worked up about it, you know, and get excited, you know. And I don't know, you know, it just doesn't fit for me, you know. I love this song that I think should be the, the theme song of this last generation. It should be the, the marching song for, you know, like in the Jesus movement, we had our own marching song, you know, like, when heavenly armor comes, when the battle of, well, the battle belongs to the Lord. That was like kind of a marching song. That was kind of like, da 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 The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing holy honor, power and might to And we, you know, it carried on for a long, long time. Well, I got a word for you. You know, maybe you should think of this song, you know, when you're getting involved with all this other junk that's out there. You know, all this stuff that wants to distract you from doing what Jesus said to do. And it says, all I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. You know, I just, oh, if I wasn't, you know, like people all around me, I'd be singing that and shouting it to the top of my lungs. Because this isn't my home. You know, this isn't my world. This isn't the place that I belong. It's becoming more obvious every day that I walk with God and I talk with Him, as I share with Him, as I read His Word, as I, even in Tozer teaching, discover He tells me all these things. I mean, I was reading Tozer and I was going, I wanted to cry because of what I've just gone through this morning on the Internet. Just people telling me, you know, they want to do this or they're biting this or they're backbiting this person or they're pointing at that person or they're doing whatever. Like little dogs and yappers that are just kind of like, you know, chewing at each other. You know, and it's like, by this shall you know you're my disciples indeed, and that you have love for one another. But we're supposedly got these people that want to 
create these huge controversies that turn out to be false. It's kind of like the big thing against Rick Warren is so false, it's getting ridiculous. I can't wait to see the day where Jesus commends him and people fall flat on their face in shock because it just blows me away how people will tear down rather than build each other up. Or like, you know, popular pastors right now, there's a few major ones that want to tear down Billy Graham of all people. It's like, oh, please, give me a break. What fleshy, you know, kind of thing have you gotten yourself into? It's all ucky, you know? Every time you mention it, it's like, ugh. You know, when people start talking that way, it's like, ugh. You just don't want to be around it. It kind of smells bad, you know? And I just, I don't know, you know? Maybe it's just me. Maybe not. Or maybe we should read Tozer and see what he has to say and what kind of teaching he's going to give us today. Because you see, in Tozer it says, Christ established true values for the human race. Because Tozer lived in our generation. He saw all this coming. And I think he has a word for us. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9.28 the Christian faith engages the profoundest problems the human mind can entertain and solves them completely and simply by pointing to the Lamb of God. Interesting. The problems of origin and destiny have escaped the philosopher and the scientist, but the humblest follower of Jesus knows the answer to both. In the beginning, found Christ there at the creation of all things, and the world to come will find him there at their regeneration. There is about the Christian faith a quiet dogmatism, a cheerful intolerance. It feels no need to appease its enemies or compromise with its detractors. Christ came from God out of eternity to report on the things he had seen and heard and to establish true values for the confused human race. You know, I think about it. There's a lot of people that don't understand, like, they'll post something, you know, on the internet and you know, I do a lot of Facebook ministry and social media ministry, and it'll come across my desk, you know, and it'll come flying down, and I'll look at it, and God will say, no. So I'll write no. I mean, it just, I can hear God almost emphatic, you know, and it's like, no. So I just write no. I don't put no in anything else. I just put no. Because it's false, whatever it may be. It's like people will put out weird statements, you know, and I'll say no. Or they'll put out some false idea and I'll say no. Or they'll say, you know, love angels. I love angels more than anything in the world. And I'll say, I don't. Or, you know, Jerusalem is my capital forever and ever. And I'll say, not mine. Because it's not. You know, New Jerusalem is called the mother of us all, but Old Jerusalem was, frankly, Jesus condemned and said, you would not see a stone left unturned until you learned to say to me, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So I, I hate to say it, but the book of Revelation doesn't say that Jerusalem's going to be like such a wonderful place to be around. And yet, we've got everybody running around kind of trying to tell you to be, ooh, gaga. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, not love Jerusalem as though it were wonderful. There's a lot of things wrong in Jerusalem. I've been there and I lived there. Matter of fact, I lived there 14 months. I could tell you a lot of things wrong with Jerusalem. <laughs> Hello, much less Israel. And, you know, we all can. You know, we, could, we live in different countries and different places, and we see it because we live there. We experience it for ourselves. We have handled it with our own hands. And I think that's the problem that bothers me the most, is that people will make these accusations or statements without ever being there because they have an idea rather than a reality. And that's what Tozer, I think, is trying to tell us. He wants us to know the reality of living with Jesus. He wants us to know the fact that Jesus was there in the beginning. We're not talking about a philosophical idea. Jesus was in the beginning, so he was there in creation. So whenever we have a problem or a situation, I always tell people, look, ask God. You know, like people tell me things that, you know, they'll say, well, I got this scripture and I got this scripture. So I'll say, well, that's fine. I understand that you have a conflict between these two scriptures. You know, and usually... I can solve it for them because you know it's like, well, this applies this, and then the answer is right above it or below. But when they go into it more, and then they keep making 
bigger issues out of something that's not really an issue, then I have to go back to the simple thing that Tozer said, and it's what I do every day, some point in time in my day. I just simply say, well, I said, I've given you the scripture, and that's what it is in the Word. Now, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. If it's the voice of another, then it's not the written word of another, it's the voice. So, Jesus' voice you can hear. So, you can hear Jesus speak to you. So, all you have to do is go ask Jesus. If you really want to know, if you really want to get rubber to the road, if you want to find out for a fact, go ask Jesus. I said, that's what I did all my life. I said, if I had a problem like, say, Calvary or, or at some other church that I went to, or if I had a problem with a person, or I had a problem anywhere in anything in my life, the first person I went to was Jesus, and I asked him. And he usually, not always, usually gave me some insight, either a word or a scripture, or sometimes spoken audibly, sometimes spoken silently, sometimes spoken inside, sometimes spoken in a still small voice. But in some way, God always spoke to me, and he always showed me something that I needed to know, not just about the situation, but about what was inside the person, because I cared. And you see, that's where God will speak to you, is if you really care to know, if you really want to know, then he will meet you where you're at and speak to you in the way that you understand. But if you're just trying to find controversy, or you're trying to argue only, you'll always be able to argue, because you can always find arguments. And you can find someone to argue with. If you're looking for religion and religious ideas, then you can always find something to debate religious ideas on because doctrine can debate doctrine. In religion, you can't argue because there is plenty of room for religion to argue with itself. But you can't argue with relationship, you see, because when you're in a relationship, you're communicating. And when you're dealing with God and man, that means one person is bigger than the other and one person knows more than the other. And one person knows it all, and the other person knows nothing at all. So, when I talk to God, I don't expect to argue with him, though I have. I know he knows it all, so I just want some insight. <laughs> what little bit I can understand, I want to. And so you see how that works? This isn't my home. This isn't where I belong. This isn't the way we're supposed to be. This isn't the way the world is meant to be. It's going to change, and it's going to be developed and redeveloped by annihilating everything that man has put his hands to. Because man, in a fallen state, has created everything with this tainted idea of what he thinks is right, not what is right. Because Jesus, in the beginning, when he created in six days the heavens and the earth and all creation, he said, and it was good. And since then, I don't think Jesus said anything except for, call no man good except your Father which is in heaven. So I don't see anything good. I don't see anything great. I just see everything like, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Everything I look at is like, well, yeah, that's nice. It's part of creation. I get a kind of an inkling of what God is like, you know, and I kind of get his handiwork, you know, I kind of, I know that there's going to be more to it, so I kind of get a, a, a fuzzy picture of it, but that's about it. This is... Jesus came from God out of eternity to report on the things he had seen and heard and to establish true values for the confused human race. Then he drew a line between this world and the world to come and said, Choose this day. Choose you this day. The choice is between an earthly house, which we can at best inhabit but a little while, and the house of the Lord, where we may dwell forevermore. Your choices today will be that. Are you building a sandcastle for your own home and you know even as I look at my tomatoes growing and this place that I'm renting you know I call it my home but really it's just an apartment but it feels like a home because it's so warm and welcoming but do you realize you do have a home you're still yet to go to you know that's welcoming you with a welcome home party that you're going to get a chance to be knowing that your whole body soul and spirit will feel completely at home there you know what I mean. Everything will fit. It'll just be complete for you. You will be happy, at peace. You will enjoy and have joy. So do you really think you got it now with your man cave, with your 
storms of life coming and testing whether you built it strong enough or weak enough or whether it yields, you know, in the wind or whether it's being devastated or you wiped out everything that you own? Or do you find that even in the flood or the hurricane or the tornado, when everything is wiped away, you just simply had a song to sing that said, all I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. Because that's what we really learn when we lose our house or our possessions or our securities that have distracted us in some way. We realize, you know what? This is all passing away. The world and the lust thereof are passing away. But Jesus abides forever. So I'm always kind of like amazed that people just don't get it. They don't seem to realize, hey, you know, if you want to go be distracted, go play with your games and your toys and your boys and your girls and do this and that and the other thing, go ahead, you know. It's fun for a while. And sometimes I do things like tonight, I'm going out dancing with my wife. <laughs> but, um, because <laughs> it's one of her favorite foods. <laughs> but they play oldies. So, even in that, I know that in eternity, you know, I'm going to dance through the universe. Boy, am I going to dance. And me and David, we're going for it because we're going to have a dance-off. David and I are going to have a dance-off. You can come in the kingdom and watch because he, I'll look him up and find him wherever he's at because he'll probably be leading worship for a while. But when he's done, because there's only a certain amount of time that he's going to lead worship, then somebody else takes over. But when he's done, I'm challenging him. I'm saying, dude, right here, right now, we dance off. And I'll throw some moves on. And we'll see what Jesus has to say about it. Because between him and I, we're going to have a blast. But you see, that's the difference between maybe me and you. Because I'm looking forward to that confidently. I know that will happen. You might not know that. You might be still thinking, well, maybe, you know, and you've got this kind of fuzzy idea of mansions and kind of strange idea of streets of gold, you know, and not too sure about either rapture or, or tribulation or whatever it may be, where I'm just like, hey, you know what? Man, this world's got nothing for me. I'm ready. I've been ready for two days after I got saved. It's like, can I go home now? You know, and God kind of spoke to me and said, no, <laughs> and showed me how long it would be. It's a long story there. But the church is constantly being tempted to accept this world as her home, but toward the world to come as we are all headed, which is where we are and we belong. How unutterably wonderful that we Christians have one of our own kind to go ahead and prepare a place for us. That place will be in a world divinely ordered, beyond death and parting, where there is nothing that can hurt or make afraid. The one thing that I want to tell you over and over and over again is to, if you want to find that song, just go find it. Where I Belong, I think it's the name of it by some kind of building name. I don't know. I don't keep track of contemporary Christian music anymore. I keep track of any other music. It's like, well, you know, here, it, here, there, here, there, wherever. You know, and if it catches me, my eye or my ear, and I think it's anointed, then I might recommend it. But for me, a lot of Christian music is just fluff. You know, it's like somebody expressing their faith, and that's nice. You know, I listen to testimonies, and most songs I treat as a testimony. They were feeling something, so they felt it and recorded it. You know, and that's good. You know, I mean, that's enjoyable. You know, there's there's a place for that. You know, it's entertainment. And some songs I do believe are anointed. You know, like Psalm Five from Maranatha Music. You know, the guy that wrote it. You know, died shortly after, and you know they recorded it and. I do believe that that's anointed because it's still one of the few songs in Psalm 5 that's recorded and stayed the same without ever being remade. Or like a lot of Keith Green music, you know, it still ministers to people <laughs> quite a few years later. Kind of like the way the old, you know, hymnals were, you know, they kept singing them for centuries. How great thou art. You know, some of them are anointed. So anyways, getting back to this whole point that Tozer brought up, the answer is Jesus, or you're missing the point. The answer is to have a relationship with Him so that you do know that you're not being distracted and that you're not being attracted 
back into the world that God has set you free from. So you're not going back to Egypt, you know, like Keith Green was saying. So you want to go back to Egypt? You thought it was better then? Or bringing Egypt into your relationship with God? Because if you are, if you've made idols, you know, like Israel or Jerusalem or Zionism or politics or Christian music, even that can be an idol, or your church or your pastor, if you made any of those idols like you did in Egypt when before you got saved, I can tell you this, they will fail you and you will fail them. But if you really want to hang on with all your heart, clutching to the very hem of his garment, wrapping your arms around God Almighty, when people say, oh, you've got to be so holy to fall down on your face. But if you want to just grab a hold and hang on for dear life, start singing that song I just told you. You know, Where I Belong. Go find it on YouTube. It's there. Where I Belong. Pretty sure it's standing with and just start singing. All I know is I'm in my home, yet this is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. Because it's not. You don't belong here any more than I do. So let's pull away from those things that are really not that good for us and kind of start heading home because I don't want to leave you behind and I'm already halfway down the road I don't know what you may do because I know a lot of you will tell me what you want me involved in but the only thing I can tell you is I'm sorry I'm already gone